Okay, so I guess uh, I'm going to start. I'm going to moderate the um, afternoon. Uh, I know we're still in late morning, but we're almost noon. The afternoon panel. And I uh, thought I would start by summing up the uh, morning session. Um, the afternoon session, we're going to look at three kind of case studies of artists. Um, to me, what I thought was really interesting about the morning session was um, we could sum it up essentially as fuck the canon, right? <laughs> because what I really loved was how all, the, all three presenters were constructing these alternative histories from really unlikely sources. And, and even in some cases, they were, these, they were uh, sources that were providing a kind of unwitting, almost counter-narrative. So I thought that's a really great balance to... Uh, where we're going to go now in looking at um, three, um, essentially, case studies of uh, looking at specific artists. And again, I just want to remind you, at 1 p.m. we're going to have lunch, uh, and it'll be outside in the foyer. It's provided for you. At uh, 2 p.m., we'll return for the keynote address and uh, a wrap-up. And we're very excited to have Charlene Villasenor Black from UCLA to be our keynote speaker. Um, let me begin by introducing our first speaker, which is um, Elizabeth Sarriedo, and she will be talking about Felix Gonzalez Torres. The title of her paper is Acts of Contestation, Ascal Felix Gonzalez Torres, and a Dialectical Approach to Latino Art History. Please welcome Elizabeth. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you to the art historians of Southern California and the Getty Research Institute for hosting this event. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, okay, so let me start with this. Okay. <clears throat> so this paper aims to situate Felix Gonzalez Torres' work Torres's work within the broader context of Latino art history. Such a reading has been largely absent from the vast scholarship on his oeuvre, which has generally characterized him as an American artist with an international reach, firmly rooted in a postmodernist conceptualist tradition. Today, I will locate the sociopolitical and aesthetic dimensions of Gonzalez Torres, of Gonzalez Torres's work from his participation in the collective group material in the late 1980s and, 90, and early 90s to his more personal minimalist installations as part of a genealogy of Latino art history whose genesis can be traced to the Chicano movement. Specifically, I draw a comparative analysis with the work from the collective ASCO, specifically from the 70s, comprised of Harry Gamboa Jr., Gronk, Willie F. Herron III, and Patsy Valdez. I argue for a dialectic reading of the work that reorients cultural identity as both constitutive to art making process practices and as a process of a shul, in this case, a rejection of the Latino as a fixed identitarian paradigm. To be sure, both Asco and Felix Gonzalez Torres worked outside the confines of Latino art, specifically through their respective deployment and reworking of postmodernist strategies. Yet, despite the fact that the members of ASCO were born and raised in the United States, and that their artistic formation took place in one of Amer America's largest urban centers, Los Angeles, their work and legacy has resided largely, if uneasily, within the confines of Chica Chicano discourse, obscuring their work from global circulation. Conversely, Gonzalez Torres, who was born in Cuba, emigrated as a child to Puerto Rico, where his early artistic formation took place, before settling in New York at the age of 22, has transcended such confines. The literature about his work and legacy has obscured instead his Latino and multicultural dimension. Though manifest in wildly disparate ways, the contestatory tactics employed by ASCO find a shared social and political consciousness with Gonzalez Torres. Furthermore, they both offered counter narratives to the normative dimensions of the art historical milieus to which they belonged. They each engaged in artistic strategies that used the body as medium, participated in social and institutional critique, questioned what constitutes public space, and broadcast salient political messages through the appropriation of and intervention in mass media platforms. Locating the work of Gonzalez Torres in relation to ASCO offers an opportunity to reevaluate and challenge received notions of what Latino, of what constitutes Latino art, 
This comparison also provides fertile ground on which to problematize and deconstruct facile assumptions often found in Latino, Latin American art histories, and Latin American art histories relative to the global consumption, consumption of art. Against this backdrop, another underlying goal is to demonstrate how cultural identity is instrumentalized to fit neatly into established art historical narratives. During the 1980s and 90s, the art, of, the art by Latino and Latin American artists called the attention of mainstream culture actors in the United States as part of the identity politics associated with multiculturalism. However, that framework advanced a narrow and essentialist narrative of Latino and Latin American art, the two often presented without distinction, as irrational, filled with colorful exuberance, and solely representational. Ignoring, of course, cultural and historical differences among Hispanics, as well as other aesthetic and conceptual preoccupations that deviated from this organizing construct. On the other hand, the emergence of the Chicano movement during the 60s and 70s has been foundational in the construction of a Latino imaginary, one in which social and political disenfranchisement, as well as the reclaiming of Mexican identity through the painting of public murals took center stage. As such, Chicano visual culture also helped cement an image of Latino art as principally narrative and as a pictorial response to sociopolitical and economic struggles. Asco, representative of the second wave of Chicano artists, equally took to the streets but not to reclaim Mexican, their Mexican heritage. Instead, they turned to their immediate environment and responded to the sociopolitical realities of their time, asserting their place as engaged by cultural subjects in contemporary American society. Asco, which in Spanish means nausea, employed conceptual practices in their ironic critique of the, of the art world establishment. Spray Paint Lagma or Project Pie in the Face, 1972, is one of the group's first public actions and representative of the experimental and irreverent artistic methods that took place largely outside of the institutional confines of the white cube. After a curator at Lagma remarked that, quote, Chicanos don't make art, Gronk, Erron, and Gamboa Jr. sprayed their signatures in black paint on Lagma's exterior walls. The tagging, their tagging of public spaces, spaces at an an art historically associated, an act, excuse me, historically associated with gang activity is transformed instead into a gesture of appropriation that both parodied and called attention to the ingrained biases pronounced by the LACMA curator. In that sense, it was an early expression and a unique one for the Chicano movement of institutional critique. Gonzalez Torres equally turned to the public sphere as the locus for contesting the pressing sociopolitical issues of his time. Instead of the deployment of the performative and the confrontational on which the members of Oscar relied, Gonzalez Torres turned to language and the aesthetics of minimalism. Untitled Billboard from 1989, seen here on your right, um, was created on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots. It reads, People with AIDS Coalition, 1985, Police Harassment, 1969, Oscar Wilde, 1895, Supreme Court, 1986, Harvey Milk, 1977, March in Washington, 1987, Stonewall Rebellion, 1969. This work is characteristic of what the artist referred to as date lines, in which a string of words alongside dates make reference to current, historical, and personal events without distinction to create a textual narrative. The reliance on language as both content and form, white words presented against a black background, belies the conceptual formation of his practice as deeply informed by theoretical modes of production found in postmodernism and feminist critique. Gonzalez Torres' appropriation of a large billboard commonly used for advertising transforms the site of commercial function into a contestatory platform. During this period, Gonzalez Torres was also a member of Group Material, a collective that sought to, quote, develop an independent group that could organize, exhibit, and promote an art of social change. Inserts from 1988, seen here on the left, consisted of a series of commissioned booklets by 10 artists to be inserted in the Sunday edition of the New York Times. Gonzalez Torres contributed one of his characteristic date, date lines, which was printed next to a drawing by Nancy Spiro. The project addressed salient national issues such as racism, the increasing armament of nuclear weapons by the United States, and the Reagan administration's denial to properly address the AIDS crisis. Yet the booklets lack the symbolic and representational content normally associated with political art, and thus characteristic, again, of the postmodernist strategies employed by artists during the 1980s. 
A decade earlier, the members of ASCO similarly transformed intend the intended function of mass media for political use. They turned to photography and film in their No Movie series, comprised of pseudo-documentaries. In Decoy Gang War Victim from 1974, a crime scene is staged at night. We see Gronk lying on the pavement in the middle of the street, playing dead and surrounded by numerous road flares used in homicide situations to block off access to the area. The quote film followed a familiar narrative. Gronk was one more victim of gang violence and retribution common in East Los Angeles area. The group then sent a still, a still from this film to various news outlets where the event was reported on as though it were true and quote, as a prime example of rampant gag gang violence in the city of Los Angeles. Asuka's appropriation of mass media, excuse me, of mass media channels is a subversive mechanism that not, that not only calls attention or calls into question the veracity and assumed objectivity of the news media, but highlights the stereotyping narrative of Latinos in mainstream American culture. By inserting their work in highly visible platforms, Asco and Gonzalez Torres alike also symbolically inserted the Latino and gay body into the public sphere. The members of ASCO, like Gonzalez Torres, understood the language of aesthetics, understood that the language of aesthetics was an equally useful tool for social commentary and contest, contestatory politics. On Christmas Eve of 1972, dressed in lavish costumes that riffed the glam punk aesthetics of the 1970s, they staged Walking Mural, a public performance on Whittier Boulevard in response to the city officials' cancellation of the East Los Angeles Christmas Parade. Valdez personified the Virgin of Guadalupe, dressed in black. Erron represented a figure from a mural who had grown bored in his confined pictorial environment. And Gronk was a Christmas tree, decked out in bright green chiffon. Two years later, Gronk wrapped about Patsy Valdez and Humberto Sandoval in white masking tape against the exterior wall of a commercial building in East Los Angeles in an, act in an action they called Instant Mural. Both of these performances exhibit Asco's penchant for humor and irony as a subversive mechanism. However, by calling the work a mural, they also offered a witty critique of the sanctimonious role that muralism has played in Mexican and Mexican-American history, while paradoxically creating a renewed place for themselves within that genealogy. Additionally, the staging of murals as performative displaces the function of muralism from a fixed historical monument to a living, contemporary, and confrontational entity. Just as significant, the actions described above also reveal the extent to which the language of camp or kitsch should be, should be also read as an interventionist tactic beyond its aesthetic dimension. Sontag describes camp as, quote, a sensibility, as a political, but also as a badge of identity, sentiments that are echoed in Ibarra Frato's formulation of rascachismo. For Asco, the language of camp was all of these descriptors, a way of rendering visible a Latino American identity that had been considered marginal, but it was far from apolitical. Personifying religious icons, the Virgen of Guadalupe, uh, historical icons, Mexican muralists, and reinserting them in a visuality of kitsch was a political statement as well. This strategy inserted the Latino body, albeit ironically, into the Euro-American art historicity of body art and performance art that prevailed during the 1970s. Through the deployment of distinct aesthetic mechanisms and responding to different historical realities, uh, Gonzalez Torres also unsettled the Euro-American dimension of prevailing art world idioms. That is, while he engaged in the tenets of conceptual art and postmodernism, he introduced a variant of the personal to address the political, as well as an aesthetic language that went against the established notions of these art historical trends. And like Asco, Gonzalez Torres's mode of production also rejected the stereotyping categorization of Latin American and Latino art that was also prevalent at the time. However, while Gonzalez Torres's installations, both public and in the museum gallery environment, increasingly circulated in mainstream American art circuits, his identity as a gay man of color, specifically a Latino gay man, should be understood as residing in a doubly liminal space. The following discussion of several iconic and lesser known works both reinforces and problematizes these claims. Untitled Portrait of Ross in LA on the left is characteristic of the participatory dimension of his work in which the public is encouraged to take a piece of the work. 
In this particular composition, cand candies wrapped in colored cellophane total the weight of 175 pounds, which represents the ideal body weight of Gonzalez Torres' partner, Ross Laycock, who died from AIDS-related complications that same year. In taking the candy, the spectator participates in the process of diminishing the pile, which symbolically implicates her in the depletion and consumption of Ross's own body. The subtle yet poignant installation, this subtle yet poignant installation character, characteristic of Gonzalez Torres's complex body of work resides comfortably within the framework of conceptual and participatory art. However, the consumption of the candy and the metaphor, metaphorical taking in of the body of Ross has equally undeniable religious associations. The act is akin to the taking of the Holy Eucharist during Catholic Mass at the, as the symbol of the body of Christ, a religious practice that the artist himself once characterized as, quote, being very Latino. Reinserting the subject of relig religiosity in connection to the body and sexuality in Gonzalez Torres's minimalist installations opens up a discursive opportunity from which to examine this Latino this Latino presence in his work. This reinforces the idea that Latino cultural histories are embedded in his practice, even as the presence of those histories are presented in a language that simultaneously rejects facile identitarian associations. This dialectical framing offers renewed ways of thinking and writing about Latino art, specifically while undermining the established framing of Gonzalez Torres as an artist working exclusively within the traditions of American and international postmodernism. Furthermore, with the introduction of the colors gold, red, and baby blue in some of his most iconic works, presented in the form of cellophane wrapped candies, plastic beaded curtains, and strings of light bulbs, Gonzalez Torres uh, contaminates the pristine environment in which minimalism and post-conceptualism reside with an aesthetic sensibility that art critic Gerardo Mosquera identifies as, quote, kitsch and also Latino. However, unlike Asco's use of a rascacho aesthetics as an act a defiance against good taste, Mosquera asserts that, quote, Gonzalez Torres' use of kitsch was in no way ironic. It was pure sentimental beauty served up without apology on the table of conceptualism. Conflating the aesthetics of kitsch with a Latino sensibility runs the risk of echoing the very essentialist narratives of which both Asco and Gonzalez Torres resolutely rejected. However, Mosquera himself recognizes paradoxically that while Gonzalez Torres, quote, worked outside the typical circuits of Cuban American and Latino artists, his education in rural, rural Cuba and in Puerto Rico, along with his participation in the Latino community in New York, doubtless conditioned his highly social and subjective reworking of conceptualism. Mosquera does not elaborate on the repercussions of these other cultural connections in Gonzalez Torres's work, arguing instead for an understanding of the artist variant uh, as part of la uh, larger Latin American conceptualism. But here I want to reorient Mosquera's comments to an understanding of cultural identity that has elided critical readings of his art making process. That is, as both a site of disavowal and renewal in which, both, in which context and locality are not as at odds, but are actually integral to global concerns. And just lastly, um, a lesser known dateline from 1988 underscores these seemingly opposing forces in his work. Printed in red on an unkempt handkerchief, the string of works read Bay of Pigs, 1961, Mariel, Kennedy, Sputnik, Mami, 1986, Madrid, Pain. Two events, Bay of Pigs and Mariel, although international in scope, also have a, a personal resonance as it represents significant dates to the artist's cultural identity as a Cuban American. More significant, however, is the inclusion of the word mommy or mommy next to the date of her, birth, of her death from leukemia in 1986. Interspersed among words in English that conjure images of crises of historical import, mommy stands out not only because it belies a certain vulnerability, a childlike sweetness, a cariño affection, but also because of its glaring foreignness. Herein lies the paradoxical nature of the notion of cultural identity in Gonzalez Torres's work. Mami should be read as the work's punctum, an, an analytical concept by Roland Barth that I refer to here to highlight how his practice is informed as much by theories espoused 
by 20th century European thinkers as it is by the vernacular and his own personal biography. In conclusion, Asko's contribution to contemporary art continues to be framed almost exclusively from the vantage point of Chicano art and culture, despite the growing and nuanced scholarship on their work. Conversely, Feliz Gonzalez Torres' identity as a Latino artist has been obscured in the critical corpus. At the 54th Venice Biennial in 2007, he represented the United States as an American artist. The comparative analysis of Asco and Gonzalez Torres I have rehearsed here today is thus intended to reveal what has been discursively obscured in the historiography in order to challenge how Latino and global art histories have been constructed, often in opposition to one another. A dialectical approach that challenges the Euro-American paradigms that have been constituted art history writ large. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Our next presenter is Karen uh, Mary Davalos, and her talk is entitled Chicano, Chicana Remix, Rethinking Art Histories and Endgames. Please welcome her. I too want to thank our um, organizers, conference organizers, and the Getty for launching this uh, event here. With Donald Trump in the White House, it has become easier to convince folks that race, class, and gender matter. They are deeply embedded in everything we do and nearly in every one of his tweets. And thus it's relevant, even generative, to consider a group of artists racialized as non-white to understand our current approach to art and nation. I draw from my latest publication, Chicana Chicano Remix, Art and Errata Since the 60s, which investigates the hidden histories of Chicana and Chicano art in Los Angeles. But this is not a study of identity. It is a critical analysis of the narrow ways Chicana and Chicano artists and their work have been conceptualized. I argue that teaching about Chicana and Chicano art requires vernacular concepts such as the remix, that, uh, concepts that emerge out of the practice itself to drive the analysis. The remix rejects the familiar narratives that evaluate Chicano art in binary terms, political versus commercial, realist versus conceptual, low versus high, and so on. Today I share with you the first and last parts of my book, Chicana, Chicano Remix, um, which was conceptualized during the first PST season in 2011. I begin my analysis with, with Sandra de la Losa's Action Portraits, which was part of the installation Mural Remix at LACMA, to illuminate this vernacular concept. I then turn briefly to a summary of the various topics to which I apply the remix and end with the remix of Los Four. During q and I'm happy to comment on the exhibitions in this season, which I think make use of the remix. Sandra de la Losa is a Los Angeles-based artist and founder of the Pocho Research Society. Her methodology is quite simple. Rather than look for the imagery fortified by the conventional discourse in art history and Chicano studies, she looked at the photographic archive documenting East Los Angeles murals of the 1970s. And then she reshuffled the images to make more apparent the construction of an American art discourse. Covering an entire wall in a gallery of the Amundsen building of LACMA, Sandra de la Losa's monumental action portraits of East Los Angeles muralists defies convention on multiple levels. The work is a visual argument that exposes our limited framing of the mural, the self, and a non-white community. Action Portraits is larger than life. It's a digital projection of Fabian, Deborah, Roberto Del Hoyo, Raul Gonzalez, Lily Flor, Sonji, and Timoy. <clears throat> the video conveys a certain theatricalization as artists paint their new bodies with samples from the mostly destroyed murals that had animated and activated the walls of an important Chicano community in East Los Angeles. The three-channel video documents the muralists as they methodically move large paintbrushes over arms, torso, hands, neck, and face. Because they work without the aid of a mural, mir mirror, the brush is deliberately placed, their hands seeking the sensations their body knows. A patch of flesh is showing on the underside of the arm, or a spot on the forehead needs another coat of paint. The multichromatic images 
<clears throat> that appear on the skin are from the samples of the Nancy Tovar collection, an archive of over 600 color slides of murals created in, Los, in East Los Angeles. Several years ago, the artist became familiar with this collection when she helped Nancy Tovar, her neighbor, with digital scanning. As Sandra de la Losa studied the archive, she realized it contained more than figurative and narrative styles. Functioning in the double role as artist and curator, her words, Sandra de la Losa draws from the themes she found in the Tovar collection. Natural and surrealist landscapes, organic shapes, texts, symbols, life forces, as well as spirals and super graphics. She extracts, slices, enlarges, and overlays these elements on the muralist bodies or moves them as if through a kaleidoscope to create new colorful patterns with the refracted images. Sandra de la Losa does not deny that social realism, overtly political iconography, and representational and figurative styles exist in Chicano murals. Her goal is simply to expand the visual and discursive frame. She does this by reframing onto brown bodies the hidden and forgotten range of elements and styles used during the Chicano movement. The mashup portraits function as both personal and communal visual representations as the muralist's bodies are canvas, frame, self, and collective memory. The flesh come canvas changes from one image to the next, sometimes rapidly, and the work becomes a public critical record of East Los Angeles' visual memories. Since the portraits vary in duration are presented in continuous video loop, Action Portraits produces an infinite number of combinations. These visual strategies reinforce the multiple subject positions De La Losa aims to amplify as she breaks from any singular index for Chicana, Chicano murals, and Chicana and Chicano artists. I want to advance the video, but I'm afraid uh, I'll take up more time, so I'm just going to let it run for a bit more and then cut it. The action portraits of Rasa muralists paradoxically hold, withhold and pronounce identity as they cover flesh and other markers of racial, gender, and social distinction. As such, the work critically engages a tension between public and private representation. For instance, several muralists deliberately and carefully paint each finger, making sure that no flesh is exposed. But we realize almost immediately that once the portrait is complete, the hands fall below the waist and thus outside of the video frame. This realization challenges the common approach to Chicano politics and its emphasis on enunciation. The covering of the body, the action, is meant for the viewer, but the result, the completion of the portrait, is not intended for the viewer's gaze. In this way, De La Losa implies that representation of the self is both a public and private phenomena, but never closed, contained, or offered for wholesale consumption. She indicts society's fixation with corporeality and racialization of minority artists. By remixing the very object, East Los Angeles murals, that have become canonized as Chicano art, or on the contrary, the object that has been dismissed as cliche, Sandra de la Losa reminds us that art history imposes its own narratives. She samples trees and flowers and psychedelic patterns, and by documenting the hidden and forgotten elements and ignored styles, she requires us to rethink our attachments to benchmarks considered essential to Chicano art. Her remixing also exposes the post-racial and ahistorical logic that dismisses Chicano art. She reconfirms the very object that has become the index for Chicano art without disavowing or essentializing the proper name for the work. She demonstrates how the simultaneous withholding and pronouncing of the proper name is a strategy for making Chicana and Chicano art more visible. In each chapter of my book, I remix the historical record and challenge as insufficient the existing discourse about Chicano art and their work, Chicano artists and their work. For example, in chapter two, I explore the errata exhibition, a vernacular mode of institutional critique that challenges a concurrent mainstream exhibition with new evidence of multiplicity, intersectionality, and other frameworks for analyzing Chicana and Chicano art. I retrace the earliest arts organizations of the 1960s for their ability to combine art and commerce, areas considered contradictory within social movements. I explore the influence of European art on 11 Chicana and Chicano artists who traveled abroad 
an unexplored topic because scholars privilege the idea of Mexican influences or assume Chicano parochialism. For example, during oral history interview conducted by the Smithsonian, Gilbert Magoo Sanchez Luhan, Revu Luhan reveals that he was stationed in Europe for three years and that he joined the Air Force specifically to go overseas and see the world, he said. But at this point in the interview, the interviewer changes the subject and says, and so what'd you do when you got back? Magoo was not alone. Several artists um, traveled abroad and I recognized that by remixing the biographic record, I'm at odds with the current PST initiative, but I urge you all to consider the ways in which our assumptions silence a history of European art and travel. I have two other um, chapters that I don't have time to discuss, but I'll share a little bit with you about the last chapter when I look at the hidden histories that do in fact reflect some of the work we're doing here in the current PST season. The Chicano art exhibition record always begins with the claim that Los Four is the first Chicano show in a mainstream museum, and this accolade is consistently marketed as LACMA's leadership. It's not an overstatement to declare that Los Four was a watershed moment in American art. It was a blockbuster exhibition, and LACMA has been rightly credited with launching the success of four artists, Carlos Almaraz, Roberto Beto de la Rocha, Magu, um, Frank Romero, as well as the uncredited fifth in the audience, Judith Hernandez and John Valadez, sixth artist. The history that is not widely known, however, and it is providing some cautionary notes, uh, is now public in the Magoo exhibition catalog. The exhibition arrived at LACMA after serious negotiation about its location and budget. The exhibition was crowded into the Linton Hall of the Hammer Wing and resources for the hanging of the show were scarce. After requests for financial support were ignored, the artist contracted a lawyer to pressure the museum for sufficient funds. The celebratory claims about Los Four overshadow the conflictive relationship LACMA had with the artist even as they were admitted into its hallowed walls. Now I wanna continue my remix of that exhibition record in Los Angeles and turned to another show in 1970 organized by Josine Iyanko called Four Chicano Artists. It opened at the Fine Arts Gallery at Cal State LA in 1970 and traveled to 19, in 1971 to Cal State Dominguez Hills and then returned to Cal State LA later that year. As director of Cal State uh, LA Gallery, Iyanko brought together the work of Carlos Almaraz, Leonard Castellanos, Robert Gomez, and James Gutierrez. She selected works that fit squarely within West Coast minimalism, Finnish fetish, and light and space movements. The artwork expressed the artist's interest in abstract forms and sensory perception, particularly through the use of reflective finishes and illumination. Ayanko demonstrated that artists' connection to regional the artist's connection to regional styles, but she did so without forgoing the term Chicano. And she seemed to understand the ways that non-white artists maneuvered multiple identities and aesthetics. Perhaps she was not looking for identity, but a new critical form. The exhibition secured significant reviews and media attention. Some commentators, however, missed the point. Art critic William Wilson could only see the quote, urban Latin ghettos as the influence of Gutierrez's castor, uh, excuse me, cast polyester and lucite sculpture, or Castellanos's colored multi sculptural um, cubes. These were not examples to him of the light and space movement known in Los Angeles. In contrast, Mildred Monteverde observed that Alvaraz. Al Almaraz filled this composition with animated figures and graffiti-like forms with no consideration for illusionistic space and scale. The gestural uh, figures and textual use, she argued, resonate with Dadaism, but in ways that negate the regional emphasis on surface. Largely forgotten by Chicano, uh, art historians, four Chicano artists demonstrated not only that Chicano art was engaged with contemporary regional and national trends, but that Chicana and Chicano artists were pushing beyond those interests. Using four Chicano artists as an index for Chicana and Chicano art allows for a rereading of Los Four. 
This remix enriches the visual narrative of the exhibition as iconographic, an interpretation that relies solely on the figurative and na narrative works that were displayed, or as unmediated cultural representations of identity presented within a mainstream art museum. By remixing the urban calligraphy, graffiti, that appears in the exhibition might be a reflection of gestural art, conceptualism, Dadaism, abstract expressionism, or pop art. And this is not a stretch, since Almaraz was included in both exhibitions, and the artists of Los Four trained at local colleges and universities and worked in graphic design. More to the point, the exhibition catalog uh, for Los Four serves an example of the artist's ease with a wide range of aesthetic approaches. The simple accordion style booklet designed by Frank Romero evidences postmodern techniques of sampling and remixing. Apart from the title, date, and location of the exhibition, as you see on the first blue page, and very short biographies, there is no interpretive text. These monochromatic pages were printed in one of four colors, and on them, Romero arranged a collage of family photographs and snapshots of the collective's art. The catalog emphasizes a a color saturation and recalls color field painting. It also resonates with the intentions of Dada to destroy visual and textual homogeneity. This rupture with the very fabric of legibility when voiced with by the explicitly racialized Chicano artist extends Dada's principles as a critique of Eurocentric notions of universal aesthetic and the role of museums in fostering the myth. When the index shifts to Ayanko's visual uh, universal, excuse me, when the index shifts to Ayanko's exhibition, the Los Four catalog resonates less of a work of documentation, representation, and figuration, and more as a modernist and postmodernist critical reexamination of aesthetic traditions of the West. This assessment is particularly valid when we consider the avant-garde printmaking techniques that produce the folio. In conclusion, the remix is not an attempt to validate Chicano art within European Western traditions. My end game is not to support the contributions approach of multiculturalism. Rather, I would like to expand the discourse on both fronts, Chicana and Chicano art history and American art history by raising questions about why some experiences and styles are invisible and what the invisibility reveals about our assumptions of non-white artists. My goal is to make more complex how Chicano art is understood to anticipate this complexity and to see it as a critical intervention. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thanks, Karen. Um, our next speaker is Gina Medaniel Tarver, and the title of her talk is Recollecting and Connecting uh, Overlooked Art of Cali Cali. Alicia Barney and Women Environmental Artist of California. Please welcome her. Thank you, Thomas, and thank all of you for, for coming here today. Um, I'm very excited to pre present this work. With this paper, I shine light on women artists who are pioneers of environmental or eco art and who, within the history of environmental art, remain under-recognized. I'm beginning a book project on one such artist, Alicia Barney, who was born in Cali, Colombia in 1952 and began her career as an artist in the late 1970s. One of her works, this one, is currently on display in Radical Women at the Hammer Museum. I want to recover a history of her art and place it within a larger story of women environmental artists, important examples of whom are from California, the other Cali, so today I'll start by showing examples of Barney's work and go on to draw a few comparisons with eco-art by Californian women. In 1977, while attending the Pratt Institute in New York, Barney began a series she titled Diario Objecto, Diary Object. The series is made up of found objects, natural and human-made, many of them bits of trash that she collected in various places and on different days. These were attached with transparent tape or strung on hanging wire structures. Some, like this one, display objects the artist found on the city streets in New York. This one, in contrast, shows objects she collected on a Colombian island in the Pacific. Seven of these wire structures comprised her MFA thesis exhibition. 
Barney arrayed her found objects chronologically, following the order in which she encountered them, and pre-Columbian Incan quipus, which are knotted string devices for recording information, were the inspiration for this type of hanging diary. They relate to the artist's ritual of taking long walks while fasting, resulting in an altered state of consciousness in which she says the objects would, quote, call to her, end quote. She proposed these collections as slices of life. When she moved back to Kali in 78, she took the series with her and re-exhibited it shortly after returning in Kali's city hall. Barney created a second Diario of Hecto series in 78 and 79 in Colombia, the work at the Hammers from the second series. In this second series, she experimented with different ways of displaying the objects. Separately contained inside plastic bags as they are here, they look to me somewhat like evidence from a crime scene. The new methods of display, though, grew out of necessity. Kali is a tropical environment environment, which meant that the organic objects she had collected quickly disintegrated, eaten by bugs and rats, and decomposed in the humidity. The plastic was a protective measure ensuring greater longevity. Once again, the objects in each picture, as I'll call them, come from a variety of different sites. Some include things she brought back with her from New York. Others are things she collected um, on trips to the beach or countryside. Others with leaves and flowers pressed between sheets of plexiglass suggest to me a link to scientific study to the kind of age, in, age of enlightenment botanical expeditions that were foundational to the development of modern art in Colombia since the first art school in the country was founded in conjunction with one of these expeditions. It's worth noting that one of Barney's ancestors, Francisco José de Caldas, was famous as an early naturalist, a colleague of Alexander von Humboldt and a member of Colombia's first botanical expedition, the Real Exped Expedición Botanica. The almost anthropological approach to these various objects, and especially the contrast between natural and human-made objects that reveals the way our consumer culture invades and contaminates not just the urban environment, but also beaches and forests, is lost, I think, in the Radical Women exhibition since only one artwork from the series is included and it contains um, only objects from an urban environment unlike this one. Actually, it has a, a couple of natural objects in it as well. And I don't mean this as a criticism of the exhibition because they were focusing really on the diary aspect of the artwork. But also lost is what comes across to me as the artist's intensive, almost obsessive attempt, evident through repetition and variation to become more aware of her environment. When Barney created this series, she wasn't yet thinking of herself as an environmental artist. Although this process of collecting and examining led her to contemplate increasingly the issue of environmental degradation. Soon she produced artworks that consciously dealt with pollution. In 81 and 82, for example, she documented pollution in Kali's river, the Rio Cauca. Barney took trips to the source of the river and to 15 points along it. She collected several liters of water from the source and smaller samples downstream, and she photographed the river and the boatmen who rowed her. In the gallery, she displayed specially constructed shallow tanks filled with the clear water from the river's source. Inserted into these tanks were test tubes containing the other water samples, suspended above a map of the river that's etched into the bottom of the tanks. The tanks with the test tubes and the map look scientific, yet they also overflow the scientific approach in their aesthetic impact, which comes partly from the ghostly etching of the map and the attention to display. Barney also collaborated with a scientist who analyzed the water samples. She included the results of the analysis in the exhibition, and you see them here as the pieces of paper on the wall above the photographs. This documental aspect of the work links it strongly not just to science, but also to conceptual art and to artists such as Hans Hacke, who were associated with both conceptual and eco-art. Her artworks such as Rio Cauca were the first ecological artworks in Colombia, and she is best known for these, although even within her native country, her work remains obscure. In their treatment of environmental and ecological art, most exhibitions, Art history books and even specialized art histories concentrate on the large scale works of male artists such as Robert Smithson, Alan Sonfist, Rich Richard Long, and Mel Chin. As is typical of the art world at large, men dominate the stories told about environmental art, 
Um, whether through, sorry, whether through exhibitions like Radical Nature, general survey texts such as land and environment art, or focused scholarly studies, for example, to life. It's easy to see why monumental earthworks are so well known and frequently studied. They have a strong visual impact and a demanding physical presence. The works by Barney, in contrast, are much smaller in scale and quite precarious in terms of materiality. The art of the Californian artist I'll show today shares these characteristics and also is strongly based in performance and ephemerality. There are female artists such as Nancy Holt, Helen Mayer Harrison working in collaboration with her husband Newton Harrison, Agnes Dennis, Merle Laterman Ukulis who have a place in current histories. However, other innovative women who pioneered both environmental and ecological art are overlooked. Furthermore, surveys of this kind of art hardly ever mention Latin American artists, although there are a couple of exceptions, such as Ana Mendieta and Cecilia Vicuña, who will be speaking at the Getty in a few weeks. Um, so one of my goals is to insert Barney's work into a broader and somewhat unknown art history by comparing it to environmental art by other women artists, paying a careful attention to differences as well as similarities. Not surprisingly, since California has been at the forefront of environmental activism as well as being the site of some of the most extreme environmental disasters, many of the artists who pioneered eco-art lived and worked here. Women are notable among these artists, yet for the most part they, like Barney, are largely absent from the histories. I'll begin my recollection of these artists with another collection of trash, one that resonates with Barney's Diario Objecto series in some very interesting ways. In 1970, Jo Hansen began sweeping the street outside of her San Francisco home. At first, the act was an aesthetic one. She wanted to beautify her neighborhood. She wrote, quote, evolving into an eco artist couldn't have been further from my mind when I went out to clean the 180 uh, feet of my 12 foot wide sidewalk in my windy new neighborhood. The term eco artist didn't even exist then, end quote. As she swept though, she began to keep some of the trash and to examine it as evidence of the wastefulness of consumerism, of social problems such as drug use, and of sociocultural changes such as those introduced by hippies. Eventually she came to see her daily sweeping as an artistic process and gradually others, such as the city sanitation workers, became collaborators in the process as they got to know her and began to arrive frequently to haul away the refuse. In 1980, she displayed the trash she'd, she had collected, organized into 40 notebooks at the San Francisco City Hall. With the sponsorship of the city's refuse committee and the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the exhibition also included interviews that Hansen videotaped with sanitation workers and videos made by artists at Hansen's invitation on the theme of trash. I haven't yet found any images of those notebooks and their contents, but Hansen described them. So for now, I'll let the verbal description stand in comparison to Barney's Diario Opecto series. Hansen wrote that she found, quote, very personal notes and letters, parking tickets, photos, and negatives, bills, collection letters, canceled checks and bounce checks, grocery lists with creative spelling, religious tracts, zigzag papers for rolling joints, drug paraphernalia, rock posters, advertising, cigarette packages, food packaging, newspapers, books, political and social protest, anti-war artifacts, artifacts, prison discharge papers, medical records, clothing, and much, much more, end quote. You can see similar items in Barney's Diario of Hecto series, though the impulse that led each artist to collect such items were distinct. To begin with, one had to do with a fixed location and the other with a kind of trance state wandering. And even though both, both artists collected, arranged, and displayed trash, they took on and led to very different mechanisms of display and engagement. Barney has exhibited her work mostly within museum or gallery settings, and she remains the primary author of the work, while Hansen consistently located not just artistic practice, but also artistic display outside of conventional art institutions and worked toward community involvement. Hansen was an early artist in residence in 1981 at Crossroads Community, the farm in San Francisco. She conducted a bus tour of illegal dumping sites in San Francisco in 1982 as part of an international sculpture conference. And in 1990, she founded the Innovative Artist in Residence Program at the Sanitary Film Com Phil Company in San Francisco, now called Recology. 
These distinctions between Barney and Hansen and between their projects relate not just to diverging artistic visions, but to differences in institutional structures and possibilities in the US and Colombia. In Colombia in the 1980s, there was no strong environmental movement and little possibility of working with non-art institutions so that galleries and museums represented perhaps the best platform for drawing attention to environmental issues. Collaboration became a hallmark of eco-art by women in California, as seen as in, another, in another artwork from the 1980s that resonates with Barney's Diario Objeto. As part of the Contemporary Arts Forum held in Santa Barbara in 1987, Seal Bergman and Nancy Merrill created the single room installation, Sea Full of Clouds, What Can I Do? Using sand, rocks, and non-biodegradable trash that they had collected from local beaches, they created a space for meditation as, quote, a forum for ecological inquiry, end quote. The space included a noticing wall where visitors were encouraged to contribute traces of their reflections by writing on the wall. The prevalence of collaboration and community involvement in California eco-art is also linked, as Joe Hansen explained, to the feminist movement, and accordingly, this art might be described as, quote, eco-feminism, and distinguished from be better known works of environmental engagement. Hansen wrote, quote, it was feminist art that fulfilled the aims of conceptual art in empowering artists, collaboration among artists and with communities, advancing life and social experiences, issues as appropriate subjects for art. This was my trail in discovering that my work was, quote, environmental art. I had never felt related to the land artists of that period who used earth features and nature as their materials, end quote. The collaborative projects of ecofeminism had no basis for development in Colombia, not just because of the absence of an environmental movement, but because of the lack of a strong feminist movement. Social norms regarding gender is another important contextual difference to be considered in examining Barney's works with those of Californian women artists. Turning now to Barney's Rio Cauca as a basis of comparison, Barney's work also parallel those of Betty Beaumont, who began making eco-art in 1969 as a student at California State University, Northbridge. Beaumont's photographic series, Steam Cleaning the Santa Barbara Shore in California of 1969, and Barney's Rio Cauca both document water pollution. Beaumont created her series in response to the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill and, and the ecologically damaging use of high pressure steam to clean it up. While Barney's Rio Cauca is the first visual artwork about water pollution in Colombia, Jennifer Gonzalez notes that Beaumont's series is one of the first visual accounts of an environmental disaster by a California artist. As Gonzalez describes it, quote, her photographs depict a small figure dressed in protective clothing, you can see her kind of merged in with the background there, carefully cleaning individual stones surrounded by a wasteland of oil blackened shoreline suggesting both the futility and the necessity of a human response to such catastrophes, end quote. Like Barney, Beaumont drew from an ideally objective means of recording facts, in her case, documentary photography, but exceeded the parameters normally associated with that practice by carefully staging, through careful staging, that gave the photographs metaphorical as well as documental meaning. A final comparison I'll make today is between Rio Cauca and a collaborative work called the LA River Project. Students of Wilson High School in Los Angeles, led by their teacher Susan Boyle, and in collaboration with the multimedia artist Cherry Galk, created this project which, as Lucy Lepard describes, quote, culminated in a 1990 student installation centered on a river of video monitors offering an array of images of tra trash-filled water surrounded by photographs, a chemically analyzed water sample, river artifacts, evidence of wildlife, and interviews with residents, politicians, and poets, end quote. Galk later made an artist book based on the project shown here since, once again, I haven't found photographic documentation of it. The lack of easily available documentation is evidence that more work needs to be done on these artists and their artworks. A similar impulse is behind these two works, to explore an issue an issue, pollution and degradation of the city's river that literally runs through the city, noticeable and distressing yet not acted upon by the government. The Smithsonian Institution adopted the LA River Project and toured it nationally, so in its time it received more attention than Barney's Rio Cauca in Colombia, which proved to be ahead of its time 
in Colombia, where only recently has pollution, especially of waterways, become a major theme in contemporary art, and only now are local governments being held to account for their role in damage to the environment. These fascinating parallels begin to reveal the multiple intertwined roots of a global movement, with movement used in a very general sense, that responded to and sought to foster environmental awareness and action. Recuperating the stories of these women is not just about equity. As we plunge deeper into our age of global warm warming, their stories are more relevant than ever and may have the potential to move individuals, perhaps especially women, to realize their own power and to act. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to invite our panelists up to the table where we have 15 minutes for uh, Q&A. I had some, well, I had a million thoughts listening to uh, these presentations and one of the things I was thinking about, maybe I can start this off by asking um, our panelists to perhaps address this question which arose, I think, in all three presentations. Um, I think there's some interesting cross-sections between a queer and feminist framework and some of the questions that arose today for uh, looking at understanding, studying the culture of uh, Latin America and Latin American artists. Um, that's broad, but I think it may be a good place to start if anyone wants to take that up. Did you say queer and Latin? Well, I was thinking, queer. yes, well, queer and feminist frameworks, I, I, it's interesting because I, I, I keep thinking about, you know, there's that famous um, Linda Nochlin essay, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? And it's really the first essay, I think, or the first uh, questioning of this notion of, of the canon. And I thought it was interesting, all of you have this set up a kind of interesting discussion in terms of the artists you were studying about how do we well, how do we think about these artists? And another thing I was thinking about, how do we teach this work too? How do we teach the canon, but also how do we remain critical of the canon? How do we address that with our students? Um, but particularly this issue I was struck by, this, this notion of, um, well, Karen, I, I love this phrase you use, limited framing for our understanding of the work that we look at. So um, when I was, um you know, in Chicano, Chicano art history, there is, there's a very small archive. There's important work that's been done at UCLA um, and important work done at um, uh, Cal, uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. The SEMA collection's been there since the 80s. And then uh, work in Texas. But, you know, most of the work, we had to gather it ourselves during the first PST. And... Um, what I saw in exhibition record is there had been a critical, insti you know, institutional critique had been taking place in, in Los Angeles since the 1970s, and it came from the first, very first errata exhibition, came from Chicana feminist artists who were um, like the Guerrilla Girls, saying, you know, that there are women too. And then as they went on through the 80s, we're starting to say it's not just that there's women, that, that we are doing work that is uh, um, intersectional in ways that the other art that is getting a, a lot more play, things like the Kata exhibition, Chicano Art Resistance to Affirmation in 1990, uh, a traveling exhibition that started at UCLA, um, that they weren't paying attention to this critical message that the feminist artists were, were articulating through their shows. And what I tried to argue is that these shows are that critical space. These exhibitions, they're ephemeral. You know, there's not always an exhibition catalog. There might be some other documentation, but the artist statements, the curator statements, um, and the work itself spoke to this, new, this criticality uh, that, that we have to excavate because otherwise we'd pretend that Chicano art doesn't begin until 1990 when we have a, a full-scale catalog with the Kata exhibition. So I had to turn to the very sources that the artists were using and they were reading things like um, Gloria Anzaldúa's uh, Borderlands La Frontera, so talking about intersectionality, talking about uh, multiplicity, and never satisfied with a, a frame that uh, was predetermined. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's very applicable to the artists I'm looking at too. Is the the problem is 
the canon comes up with these very narrow categories and these really simplistic kind of genealogies that, that ignore the intersectionality that's mm -hmm. so, so important to these very powerful and um, kind of unique developments, yeah. Well, in, in the case of Felix Gonzalez Torres, um, and just, you know, spe specific to your question, um, it's interesting, you know, one of the things that I, that I try to do is, you know, look at how artists, you know, through the lens of Gonzalez Torres have been constructed. And that construction of Gonzalez Torres as a queer artist obviously is, is very prevalent in the literature. But yet in this case, it's the opposite where the Latino, you know, obviously that's one of my, my main points. Um, and so, you know, what, what is behind the obscuring of that part of his identity mm -hmm. versus the highlighting the other? Um, so, so again, I think in, in, these, in, in rewriting these art histories, those are the kinds of questions um, that I try to, you know, pose what might seem like seemingly very different. And they are Asco and Gonzalez Torres, but again, you know, through that, through that lens of how they're constructed. And in this case, you know, the queer identity was, is there and yet the Latino isn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Do we have questions from the audience? Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for the, for the great panel. I really appreciate um, all three presentations. Um, I have a question um, specifically to Ms. Arnaldana regarding the uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, to Gina uh, McDaniel Tarver regarding your presentation of um, Alicia Barney. I, I, I had known her work just tangentially, but I really appreciate all the uh, uh, kind of nuance that you brought to the presentation. My question is regarding to um, the question of environmental activism uh, in Latin America. So, um, you know, um, Groups like uh, Acción Ecológica that began out of university systems in Quito and have been working in the Andes and have been, and other groups like that that have been working are, have always been sort of tied also to working closely with indigenous groups and activists. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, the history of uh, uh, of uh, you know Alicia Barney's interest in, in her cultural and family inheritance into this question. Um, also kind of begs the question of where is the indigenous, no? Uh, and I think that like there's something about that kind of framing that I think could be, um, could be interesting to look at uh, in relationship to how one frames uh, environmental knowledge and indigenous activism and the large ecology of, of, uh, of that cosmology and how it, it finds itself informed in legislative actions in the Andes, yeah. or even in like uh, political activism. And right. I feel like that's like a central thing that, in some ways I find that PST LA, LA in general has somehow mm -hmm. often missed that opportunity to make those connections back to, to, to larger political movements and the question of indigeneity, which is often yeah, overlooked. I, no? Well, and especially now with the water protectors and mm -hmm. Bertha Carceres and yeah, it, it involves a lot of women too, women activists, indigenous women activists. Um, Alicia Barney is very, is very white and very elite. And she has a great admiration for indigenous culture and, and studies that, you know, she was influenced by the Kipus, but she's really outside of that culture. I do think she, you know, one of, one of the reasons she has reverence for the culture has to do with, you know, an environmental, um, valuing and awareness, so I think, I think that's true. I, I would really like, I mean, I've been thinking about it a lot. This, this topic is new to me. The work that I did before was of an earlier period, um, but I think there's a great need for, I'd like to maybe co-edit an anthology on um, environmental activism and art in Latin America, because I think there's so much out there that's really interesting and very, um, very good and very relevant to what's going on today that, that needs to be studied and published. And I mean, obviously there's a lot in, in the U.S. too, in the U.S. history of environmental art. So yeah, I, I appreciate that comment and I think it's, it's very good because especially um, from, you know, the little I know of the um, art and environmental movement in Peru is very much involved with indigenous culture. Yeah. Thank you. 
uh, wonderful conversation. I wanted to ask Elizabeth, um, great paper, um, if you could elaborate more about this erasure, right? Um, mm. Feliz uh, Torres, right? Um, I wonder if you had a sense of when and, and what accounts for that erasure, right? And also parallel to ASCO, because ASCO also is often, you know, the Chicano right. and any kind of engagement is also erased. And one yep. of the wonderful things of seeing the exhibitions is that there are some where you actually see, right, ASCO engagement in the Chicano movement in ways that oftentimes that, that story is not told or not highlighted, right? Um, same with Felix uh, Torres. So I wondered if you could, um, so I love the comparison, right, mm -hmm. and maybe push the ASCO Chicano erasure, but also think about what, whether the market or, oh, absolutely. or what accounted for Felix's erasure. Like, for instance, his Puerto Rican roots, you know, he's studying, in, nobody would ever know that. Right. It's like this kind of polluted aspects of these trajectories mm -hmm. that need to be erased. So the question is, in addition to accounting for that, if you could identify, you know, the actors and agents and forces that contribute to that erasure and also how they impact on the trajectory. Like, at what moment, right, mm -hmm. did they have to leave that ethnicity behind or forced to in order to jump into that other recognition, you know? So it's so important, thanks. Um, yes, thanks for those great questions. And they're all uh, concerns that I, I should add that this is a very small sort of slice of my dissertation project, which looks at the construction of Cuban art um, outside of Cuba, specifically in the United States. Uh, but for this particular conference, I felt that obviously the, the comparison between Gonzalez Torres and ASCO was, a, was an appropriate one. In terms, um, you know, with regard to the erasure of Gonzalez Torres' Latino identity, um, that is one of my principal sort of uh, inv investigation um, goals, but it's very much rooted uh, w with the art market. There is, and, and very specific to how the Felix Gonzalez Torres Foundation has uh, construed the image of Felix Gonzalez. Um, I am trying to get to, to those archives, um, but it was interesting that in my correspondence to them, um, of course, I, you know, I, I was very aware that if I just straight off the bat asked them, told, would tell them that my interest is in inserting Felix in a Latino uh, you know, paradigm, I, I knew that I would not get an answer back. So, um, I, you know, I sort of, um, the question was primarily about my, my dissertation research, but um, at one point, and I'm talking about the construction of Felix and identity in, in very loose terms in, in my correspondence, but at one point I get a response from, from an assistant in, from an associate in the foundation where she says it might be of interest to you to know that Felix Gonzalez Torres was an American citizen and that he preferred to be um, called an American artist. Um, and, you know, and that, that's a very sort of generalized statement, but I, I want to get, I would want to get at, at one point, you know, can she say that with such authority? And my next question was, well, I want to gain access to, to Felix's letters and, um, and archives which actually don't belong to the foundation but to the estate and was told that that's, that's not really um, available to scholars. So his voice even in, in that context is, is very much being silenced uh, because I'm sure, I mean, just from, the, from other archives um, and, and other materials that I've come across of Felix's own writings, there was, you know, there's an essay that I want to write that titled, you know, when did Felix Gonzalez Torres lose his accents in the mm -hmm. Felix and in the Gonzalez? Because when you find letters from, um, <clears throat> from his, you know, earlier career, he very much, you know, signed his name with accent in the E, accent in the Gonzalez and the A. Um, in fact, in Julie Alt's book, there's a reproduction of a, um, a typewritten letter, and you can tell that he went back to that letter and, and manually put those accents on his, on his mm. name. So at some point, those accents disappear, and, and precisely, yeah, this, that's part, one of my you know, lines of inquiry that I hope to, to be able to um, gain access to, to the archives and, and kind of trace that. Um, you know, and, but again, I think it has very much to do with the market. And one of the things that I would like to, you know, unpack a little further in, the, in this uh, discussion is, yes, precisely, um, you know, sort of pitting multiculturalism, which obviously, you know, he didn't want to be kind of pigeonholed into that, that very confining um, aesthetic, if you will. But then, 
you know, you have them as a global actor, as if these two things were, you know, are mutually exclusive, right? Um, with regard, so, so I think the market, you know, Felix, the reason why to me Felix is a very useful figure in this whole argument is, is because he has, it's such a clear case of how certain narratives get advanced either by curators, um, you know, sort of the gatekeepers of how Felix is, is projected uh, to the very, you know, extent that he, again, represented the United States at the Venice Biennial. Um, with regard to ASCO, I think that to a certain extent the opposite has happened, right, where these are American artists and yet uh, they're always, you know, again, discussed within the framework of, of their legacy in the Chicano movement. Um, I think that the recent scholarship and projects like um, ASCO Obscure of the Elite and Phantom Sightings in particular try to at least open up the, discursively where their contributions fall outside of that framework, but it's still very much you know, rooted to, to that cultural specificity. Um, we don't hear a lot about, I mean, if you open up, uh, say, Claire Bishop's um, book on participatory or social engaged, socially engaged art, you don't find ASCO in that, um, you know, in, in that book. So my point there being that I think that there are opportunities to, to do with ASCO the complete opposite. In other words, open up their legacy to much, you know, sort of international, national, and, and, and global. Um, Karen wanted to yeah, respond. I and wanted then, to also add to and that. And we have to that, wrap up. Um, <laughs> uh, so just quickly, you know, the, the show that Rita mm. Gonzalez, who's in the audience with us, uh, Osco, Lead of the Obscure, co um, curated at LACMA, the, the catalog is a beautiful, beautiful document yeah. of that nuance between um, how to insert but not uh, eviscerate right. the kind of political engagement that they were. Uh, using through the Chicano movement. And so I would even encourage you to look more closely at the way Jesse Lerner um, considers the mural in that catalog because he doesn't position Osco as contrary to Chicano muralists. He says uh, in a beautiful way that I can't reproduce here, but it's more nuanced. So um, I, would, I would encourage you some more rethinking on that lines because, because of that show, I went and did work on Osco's role in the Day of the Dead here in Los Angeles, and he, they had been pitted as intervening against Day of the Dead, organized by Self-Help Graphics in the 70s, and my looking at the archive said, no, they were just asked to come and participate and shape what we now see as Day of the Dead performance art. Um, so I think there's a lot more in the archive that has been has not been uh, documented. Well, yeah, and I mean, in, in that same catalog, I know that Deborah Cullen uh, does a fantastic job at inserting ASCO, um, you know, in sort of the broader performance mm -hmm. art, body art that was happening in the United States, but interestingly in Latin America. Yes. Um, so, you know, the, of course that's not to say that that, that hasn't, but, but still it seems like the large critical corpus still um, is, you know, um, understands their their work through that very specific mm -hmm. lens. Well, thank you, everyone, well, and please I, join us for lunch. Yeah.